So what you're seeing here is is um, a, a, a really striking example of a sh what cities would look like if you place less emphasis on the needs of cars and more emphasis on the needs of children. Um, so this is one of the Barcelona super blocks. Mm -hmm. um, and I dare say some of your uh, viewers will be familiar with that idea of, of looking, if you like, looking down on the, the street grid and, and recognizing that actually a lot of that grid uh, you can you can you, you can break it up. You can repurpose some of that space that's taken up by tarmac. Hi everyone, I'm John. Welcome to the Active Towns channel, where I share a selection of my podcast conversations and videos profiling some of the promising efforts happening around the globe to promote a culture of activity, in the hope that together we can grow this movement. And in this week's episode, I'm truly honored to have Tim Gill, author of the thought-provoking book *Urban Playground*. How Child-Friendly Planning and Design Can Save Cities, on to talk about his work to reframe how we look at streets and public spaces. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Tim Gill. Hey, it is an absolute honor to welcome to the Active Towns podcast, all the way from the UK, Tim Gill. Tim, welcome. It's great to be here, John. What I'd love for us to do, just to, to sort of introduce you to the audience, is just have you take a moment to say a few words about yourself and perhaps how you got passionate about this field of study. Sure. So I'm an independent uh, researcher and writer and consultant, and really all of my work focuses on, on, on the idea of expanding children's horizons and, and making the case for children to have more everyday freedom in their lives. So freedom to play outdoors, freedom to get around. Um, and and so although I do a mix of, of you know, writing, um, consultancy work, um, uh, independent scholarship, it, it all stems back to that vision and that goal of, of saying, you know, we need to get kids out of doors and active more. We need to give them more freedom to walk and cycle. And, and, and it's been something that I've been doing as a, as it were, a freelancer for a, a good fifteen years or so. But before that, I worked for an NGO, uh, so a campaigning organisation that that had a focus on children's play, and and I got into that. I mean, to be honest with you, initially I kind of fell into this territory. Um, we're going back to the mid nineties now, so it was it was a fair old while away, but. Um, you know, a job came up that seemed interesting, fitted with 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 some of my goals around yeah, uh, making a difference. Um, and the topic of children's free time just really got under my skin. It was a topic that you know, not adults don't really pay a lot of attention to. Uh, you know, we were of course we're all focused on kids going to school and you know the relationship with the family, but but that journey of childhood. And, and, and how children gradually get to grips with the world around them and kind of grow into being a, an independent human being. It just seemed to me really interesting and underexplored. And then in 1998, I became a dad and the whole topic became much more personal and, and, and engaging. And really, I've, I've, I've stuck around uh, ever since because I continue to find it fascinating and rewarding. Fantastic. And uh, along the way, <laughs> you've, you've written a couple of books. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, that first book, and then we'll shift to your most recent publication. Sure. So my first book was called No Fear, Growing Up in a Risk-Averse Society. It came out in 2007, mm -hmm. and it really picked up on uh, this debate about, you know, are we interfering too much in children's lives are, are we you know bubble wrapping them too much right. um and this was a, a debate that was quite lively here in the uk and i know it's lively in the us as well and and actually it's a, it's a it's a, a hot topic in many parts of the world and and my interest in that came from my interest in children's play and particularly playgrounds public playgrounds right. where you know anybody who has eyes to see <laughs> Could, could see the trend over the last 20, 30, 40 years of, of playgrounds becoming ever more 
dull and sterile and 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 really not worthy of attention by any child over the age of about six um and you know so the question starting you know why is this happening um what's going on what what can we do about it and 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 what does it tell us about not just playgrounds but about the way we see children and the way we think about children in society and so i was lucky enough to have a um a, a philanthropic organization a foundation the kalu school banking foundation uh find out about some of the writing that i've been doing on this topic and they say you know what um we think this is really interesting and important for our work in, mm-hmm. in the arts and culture um, and social policy. So, yeah, write us a book. So uh, I did. I used Playgrounds as the kind of key case study, if you like, um, and really made the case that, that what had been going on was was that we we sort of lost confidence in children, that we, we, right. we've infantilized children. We, we've adopted what I call a philosophy of protection, that our job of adults is to completely protect children from all possible sources of harm. And that that was paradoxically um, not helping children prepare for a, for a world that is, you know, not particularly unsafe, but certainly sometimes unpredictable and throws up challenges so so that was that was the first book um and and that apart from anything else got me more interested in the built environment you know in public space and transport because these were arenas they were topic areas where i could see this anxiety about children and children's safety being played out and um you know lucky enough to be able to kind of continue to focus on that topic more recently yeah. And and we'll stick with that first book and that concept of the playgrounds becoming ever uh, increasingly dull and uninspiring and ultimately uh, the unintended consequences of trying to make it safer. <laughs> you know, again, that risk yeah. adverse uh, aspect of it, you know, we, we end up, like you said, just trying to bubble wrap the, the children uh, to such a level that, you know, because as, as you will know, you are a parent. And so <laughs> no parent wants their child to go through uh, a, a harrowing, painful, potentially life altering, you know, experience. Um, and so it's, it's instinctual, I think, to want to protect. Um, but at the same time, I think what we, what you're saying and and what the studies have shown and history has proven is that if we, uh, helicopter parent, and if we try to, you know, bubble wrap them, uh, they're not able to learn at the same level. And, yeah. and have that same rich childhood that uh, would otherwise be there. Um, I can think to multiple personal experiences, <laughs> and I have the scars to show them to, you know, to prove that yeah, I was your typical boy, and and I did stupid stuff sometimes, and you know, it's you know from a broken arm here to stitches over there, but it also became part of my learning process yeah you know, absolutely I, yeah and i think that that you're right that parents do have a kind of impulse or instinct or you know wish to protect their children from harm yeah. but parents also i think want their kids we want our kids to grow up to be confident capable resourceful right. independent right uh engaged human beings and and so there is a tension there and and in I guess in my book and in my work, I, I want to to make explicit that there's this balancing act going on all right. the time. That it, there's no such thing as absolute safety. There's that, you know there, there's no such thing as zero risk, and that all of us, parents, educators, planners, um, you know, we 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 live in a world where uh, sometimes. People face challenges where we have to learn how to deal with, you know, finding our way around with with potentially socially difficult situations or with physical challenges. Um, we don't throw our children to the fates, but we also need to allow them the chance to learn through their own experiences and their own ex- 
and their own mistakes. And as you say, that's actually a very familiar way of learning for all of us, actually, even children today. Well, this is, you know, there's um, sometimes a danger that we think, oh, today's kids are completely isolated. Well, they're not. Kids are well aware of these debates, just as we are. And so it's a it's a case of bringing that pendulum back to a more balanced perspective, rather than just focusing on the downside of of of, of risk. Right. You just mentioned the fates there, <laughs> and so um, I know that your your both your undergraduate and graduate degrees are in philosophy. How much is philosophy those early uh, that early study of philosophy? Uh, perhaps you know later on looking back, how how much is that? you know, instructed you, you and, and sort of guided your career? Well, that's a big question to drop in. Um, yeah, just what I, the I heck, think, you, know, you said it, you put fates in there, boy, you, you teed it up for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I, I do, I have a, a kind of philosophical frame of mind. I, I like to um, frame questions in a kind of open way and maybe see things in, um, from a point of view that maybe hasn't been particularly explored, I'm I am a believer in the value of evidence, you know, and of, of actual you know of data and of um, of, of argument. Yeah, I think sometimes there are there are nuances that that we can miss if we just go straight with the gut. And actually, risk is a really good example of this because you know one of the challenges around risk and safety is it's an incredibly emotive topic, right. you know, and and you know a, a parent sees a child getting hurt or a child is hurt themselves. That's a very emotionally potent experience. And it's, right. and in order to make sense of those episodes where the child gets hurt or falls over or, or has an, a, a, a bad argument, we need to move on from the emotions that arise in the immediate aftermath of those uh, episodes. Right. And that, I think it, there is a sort of philosophical aspect to that. Of, Absolutely, of, yeah. And, and, and of, of saying, you know, part of being a human being is that we we aren't just swimming in a sea of emotions, that we, you know, we're trying to make sense of our lives. We're trying to take a, the bigger picture into account. We're trying to think about the societies we live in and how we might want them to change. So, right. so yes, it, it's, there's, there isn't, I wouldn't say, a particular philosophical viewpoint that mm -hmm. I'm wedded to, but I, I do believe in that sort of process of inquiry and of, exploration of topics and concepts and, and 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 how that can help us make sense of you know complex questions and i th and i think the relationship that children have with with their neighborhoods is and, and the relationship that we all have with cities is a really it's almost a, a paradigmatic complex topic you know you change right. something here and it has different effects over there and well what are your what's your value base what's your starting points where do you intervene how do you make sense of the data that you get? Those are all, a lot of them have, uh, have a philosophical uh, aspect to the questions. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Good stuff. And and I, I have recently rediscovered um, uh, Stoic philosophy and, and, and looking at, you know, everyone from Seneca to Marcus Aurelius and, and, and really the, the thought process. And I end up noticing that a lot of the things that, that I talk about with active towns and I talk about in urbanism circles, you know, ends up, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, there's connections here. And a big part of what we're, uh, what we're discussing today too is, is that opportunity. And, and specifically with that first book is, is that opportunity of growth and being able to learn mm -hmm. from experiences and not making the, you know, the human sort of overlay uh, of assumption of you know what is good and what is bad, and and being able to have that those as growth opportunities and growth experiences. So yeah, yeah and, and also that that um, it, it's it's helping people get away from a particular model of learning and growth. Right. That, that we're we're very invested in 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 you know in 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 the UK and the USA in a, in a a top down education model right. of growth that 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 for children learning means being taught and means you know the transfer of knowledge from adults to children and we completely underestimate or fail to notice the learning that children do for themselves that they do through their own efforts through their own experiences 
that children are not passive recipients of knowledge, but are active agents in their own, um, you know, ways of making sense in the world and of the world. And and that is actually quite central to the, the work I do around risk, um, mm-hmm. which is still an important part of my, if you like, my day job, but right. also the work around you know, planning, design, public space has become more central to what I've been doing more recently. Yeah. Because really, when we look historically at playgrounds, uh, we know that playgrounds really emerged as the built environment started to transform into a more, con- you know, car-centric, automobile-centric design. And so, lo and behold, that brings us right to your your, your second book here. And I'm going to pull the the cover up on this, as, you know, so as a as a platform of of talking about this a, a little bit more. Um, it is again urban playground: how child friendly planning and design can save cities. And so, this is exactly what you were talking about: is how you started to see that shift of of concentrating. Um, not so much on the playground, but on the the urban design and the built environment and mobility of children. So, Tim, here's my question for you. What do you have against kids? Why are you trying to turn them loose into the urban environment? Well, uh, the, the eagle-eyed viewer might notice that, yeah. that it, it is quite a, quite a playful or childlike image on the cover, mm-hmm. but there is not a single piece of play equipment on there. Right. And in a way, that's one of the messages of the book. And you captured it, the historical insight. Yeah. You know, 150 years ago, there was no such thing as playgrounds. Yeah. Um, kids, kids played in the streets. They played anywhere and everywhere they could. Yeah. Playgrounds were invented uh, mainly as a response to the growth of traffic right. um, and concerns about, about children's um, safety. And also a little bit around the, the sort of, it, the, you know, the, the moral uh, the sort of, moral interaction of children with adults and that the, the, the particularly working class children will be corrupted by spending too much time in the adult realm. So we had to create these safe places called playgrounds. Right. And um, I think that is a fundamentally flawed way of thinking about children's relationship to the city. And of course, I'm not the only person to think that. I mean, I'm sure you're well versed in the, the, the arguments of Jane Jacobs, who devoted a whole chapter of the death and life of great American cities to this very topic. And I think it's, it's, a, it's telling that, you know, it's a whole chapter. It's chapter four of the book. So very early on in her book about, if you like, the, the, the failure of the playground and, as, a, as a way of catering for children's needs and wishes in, in, in urban environments. And... Uh, I thoroughly subscribe to to that that basic critique. You know you, that we, if we want children to feel part of the city, to understand how different bits of the city work, uh, to to be connected to people beyond their own homes and families and their schools, um, then children need to have the experience of being active in the city, right. uh, being you know active physically but also active in the sense of sort of engaged visible citizens and so that's uh you know it's 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 a value position it's a point of view uh and it does go against the grain of quite a lot of so much explicit thinking about children but just the sort of the 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 unquestioned assumptions about family life uh that have been in play certainly in, 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 in high income countries for, for the last 40 or 50 years. Um, but I think what's interesting is now a growing sort of awakening or at least, you know, questioning about that, those assumptions, uh, whether it's in the fields of education or in urban planning uh, or transport, that, that, that we, uh, you know, different professional groups and policymakers and thinkers are, saying, you know what, actually, is this a healthy situation for kids to be essentially brought up in reservations uh, where they don't uh, or they have very, very limited contact with the world of work, with the world of adults, with public space, uh, with even with other children now, um, or, or that their, their, their worlds have become mediated by technology. And now that's an interesting topic. You know, we've all gone through a period of the last year and a half or so where our worlds have shrunk and our social lives have often been mediated by technology 
And I think a lot of us have felt pretty uncomfortable, if not depressed about that. But and so, you know, the lockdown that many of us have, have, have experienced is almost, it's a speeded up version of the gradual creeping lockdown that we, children have seen unfolding over the last two, three or four generations, which might be a cue for you to pull up figure 1.1 1. 1 yeah, of yeah. Urban Playground, yes, yes. Uh, which, I, which tells that story. The story really begins with uh, uh, the um, map, one that here. one. Uh, yeah. And 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 pe- listeners and viewers may be reflecting on their own childhoods and the contrast of their childhoods and ch- children's lives today. Mm-hmm. And this map tries to encapsulate what I think of as a, a fundamental change in children's lives over successive generations. So what you're looking at is a map that shows what you might call the right to roam or the roaming range of four eight-year-old children. Right. But they're four children who are in four generations of the same family and they all lived in the same city. And so the big blob that you can see that takes up most of this map is is the home territory or the roaming range of the great grandfather in this family. So he could go six miles, 10 kilometers across the city on his own. Mm-hmm. And then you can see the smaller circles and that's the, sh- the way that the, the roaming range is shrinking with each generation. And then you end up with the yellow dot that you can see uh, on the left-hand margin. Right. And that's the son in his family. And he's actually allowed to go to the end of his street. Right. But we know from, from studies and from the data that that's more everyday freedom than, than most eight-year-old kids today uh, are given, certainly in, in, uh, in the UK and in North America. So th- what this map shows you is, is, as I said, the sort of this generational lockdown that that has um become more and more significant in children's lives and it's not like anybody sat down and thought oh you know actually we 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 really think it's a great idea for kids to to be just never getting out of the house it's a side effect of wider social and and physical changes and one of the most important changes that this map speaks to is the growing dominance in our towns and cities of the car yeah. and if you speak to any parent about what they're most worried about in terms of you know letting their kids get out and about um then it's top of the list is the fear of traffic right. uh, and 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 so that's why a lot of my work and a lot of my book focuses on how we can you know create less car dominated neighborhoods and give children back some of the freedom that previous generations of children have enjoyed. And that, in fact, is is the core question that you outline uh, in the the beginning of the book. It is, what type of cities do we want our children to grow up in? A car-dominated, noisy, polluted, devoid of nature, or walkable, welcoming, and green? Right. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. And, and, you know, um, anyone who's watching this, Mm -hmm. we know what their answer to that question will be, I think. But but even beyond, if you like, you know, the the committed um, active cities or or progressive urbanists, there's a bigger pool of people. And actually, a lot of what I hope my book will will, will reach, the people they'll reach, is the as yet unconverted. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's your your regular guy, and often is a guy who's working in a transportation department in a in a town or a city, or who's uh, managing the parks, or in charge of you know new housing developments, and who actually has quite a big influence over the shape of our towns and cities, or in how we get around our towns and cities, mm-hmm. and who maybe just hasn't thought about children and young people in their work who you know we all know that your typical transportation guy focuses on cars maybe is aware of this debate about bikes but hasn't really said oh but what about kids you know Mm -hmm. what what about my kids and the kids of people i know and so that that phrase the subtitle of the book about how child-friendly planning and design can save cities Mm -hmm. i mean that sounds pretty aspirational but it's it's a genuine reflection of the of the goal of the book, 
that that you know cities are a lot of cities are in a mess right now um and uh and it's only getting worse and you know here in the uk we've also just come out of the cop 26 the big climate change conference supposed to be you know the forum where the world's leaders figure out how we can create a better future for us all um and cities are at the heart of a lot of those questions and so the message of the book is um, when we're trying to figure out the direction of travel, you know, the, the vision, the future of towns and cities, thinking about how they work for kids is a really powerful tool for building a positive vision, for building a consensus about what a city looks like or should look right. like. It should be green. It should be easy to get around. It should be a place where you see you know, even young children, uh, and also you see older people as well out and active in the street. Um, and so it's, it's a way of um, strengthening the case for the changes that, you know, a lot of people watching this uh, will already know about and, yeah. and, and be signed up to. Yeah. And I just uh, shifted over to this particular graph because that individual that you just referenced, that municipal official and or politician, you know, that is, you know, the 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 individual and or group of individuals that are making some of these policy decisions and, and moving things along. Uh, walk us through the different aspects of five different aspects of, or, yeah. uh, you know, of this. OK, so I'm going to back up a little bit because the book, um, it, it, it focuses or a lot of the content of the book is based on case studies of cities. Right. So there's there's some assumptions there, which I'll, I'll make explicit. And I say at the start of the book, firstly, that a lot of a lot of the changes that we're all talking about are in the gift of cities. You know, if you look at transport planning, parks, um, housing, those are all municipal functions. So of course they're shaped by national policy and we want governments to be on side at the national level. But but really what many of us are wanting to see is change at the city level. Right. So my book focuses on cities and it looks at about a dozen cities and, and they're all case studies of cities that have taken seriously this idea, this vision of becoming more child friendly. So I visited most of the cities. I spent you know some time uh, speaking to decision makers, seeing what's happened, looking at the processes. And I've come up with this implementation model, this what I call a hub and spoke model. And that's what you're looking at now. And you're absolutely right. At the heart of this change model is an official, um, you know, one or more people in the municipality who have taken up the who are flying the flag for making the city more child friendly. So they're the hub, they're the centre of the action. And, I, and a number of cities I saw this in, 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 you know, actually unfolding. But around that hub are a key set of activities, really, um, or, or types of, of, of programmes of work. And I'll just go around them. So there's links to planning and transport, mm -hmm. right? You, not just one, but both. Um, effective involvement crucially the involvement of children and young people, bringing their voices into the municipal debates and the policy making and the culture shift that we want to see. Third, a focus on residential neighbours. I mean, this I hope should be obvious. If we're talking about children and families, we're talking about where they live. So we're talking about residential neighbourhoods. Um, you know, that, that's where, as families, we spend 80% of our time. Now, that's not to say that, you know, downtowns or business districts aren't important as well. But but a lot of the particularly the big chunky debates about transportation often go straight to, you know, the city commute and, right. and leave yeah. and forget about how people get around the neighbourhoods. So that's important. The fourth element, yes, investment in space and mobility um, and investment, of course, is the key word here, which is talking about hard dollars you know, real cash being spent on improving mobility on the one hand and public space on the other. And finally, actually figuring out what difference this is all making. So having right. some good systems in place to capture, you know, are more kids walking and cycling to school? Are we increasing the availability of green space or the number of parks that kids can get to? So that 
that's the model um, and it's and it's my synthesis of what I saw in cities like Vancouver, uh, Ghent, uh, Rotterdam, um, Boulder, Colorado, where you're based, you know, where there, there's you can you can go to these cities and you can see the difference that these programs are making. You can point to city squares or residential neighborhoods or um, parks and and see how they've been improved through this lens of children. Hey, everyone, please stand by. We're about to talk about one of my favorite public space transformations in the city of Boulder, Colorado. But first, I wanted to check in and just simply say, if you're enjoying this conversation, please be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment, and most importantly, consider sharing it with others. And of course, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel by clicking on that button and bell right down there. Thank you so very much. Okay, let's get right back to it with Tim Gill. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember when this particular uh, installation, uh, which is right in front of our public library and just uh, just off of the Boulder Creek path, and you know was installed and, and came in, and I was just I had to smile. And and part of the what you don't see is that um, where this is being uh, where this image is being taken from is very close to an entirely huge bank of of bike racks <laughs> which are always well used uh in this environment and yeah it it's so encouraging to see this type of transformation of public space this used to be just a sterile you know grassy mounded area uh it it was nature it was you know it's just you know, re for, you know, very closely removed from where the parking lot, the surface parking lot is. We don't have to go into criticizing that here nor there, but um, but it, it was wonderful to see that this liveliness came to it. And walk us through some of the Im the elements of this image, because again, it's not like your typical playground. Hmm. Right. So. First point, um, I'm not down on playgrounds. I think playgrounds have a role to play. Yeah. I'm, I'm certainly critical of the, the, the reservation model of the playground. Mm -hmm. um, but but you know, one thing that I hope will strike people looking at this image, it's not clearly, you know, there, there, there isn't a great big high fence around it. It, it, it invites exploration. It, it sits as part of a wider uh, chunk of the public realm. It's also... Uh, I hope people will agree, a very rich set of offers for kids. Um, and again, that's a message from my book is that the, the, if, you know, if, you want to, if, if we want to create nice neighbourhoods for children, then one of the things we do is just give them fun things to do. And the more fun things, the better. So you've got water, you've got um, climbing challenges, you've got um, uh, nature uh, it, it, you know, being present, and also, obviously, this is going to be a much more attractive and 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 changing uh, space over time as those trees mature. Um, and you've got some challenge. You've got some, you know, some climbing. Um, you've got. Uh, you've also got a kind of. I hope people will agree. Just, just an aesthetically attractive place that that right. you know it it it, it doesn't scream you know sort of formulaic it, it, it's 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 got some character to it. It, it it's it's unique and special for this place um and so these are all features that i that i uh, promote in the book as being you know part of what making somewhere child friendly means it means really thinking carefully about how we can create these rich uh welcoming engaging um and diverse offers for uh, children and families yeah, yeah. there's a one a, one other thing i think is really interesting about this scheme that, that you won't see from the image but it's really part of the story is that and this is from from the good people at, at growing up boulder it's the, the the children's participation ngo that 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 was involved in this scheme is that you know that uh, you may know this better than me but i'm told there was quite a lot of controversy and debate about this downtown project mm -hmm. And, you know, various vested interests sort of piling in, you know, pushing for their agenda. And and from the municipal point of view, what the, the officers, one of the things that the officers were saying was that having children's voices in the mix, mm -hmm. literally in those debates in City Hall, 
helped to kind of transcend to you know to, to move beyond the sort of turf wars and, and jockeying for position that the different groups of adults were were going through because the the, the voices of the children helped to elevate the conversation right. um and and to give a maybe a you know a a, a, a kind of a, a, a more long-term and collective set of ideas about what this space could do and I, and again i think that's an insight that applies more widely and a number of the cities where i spoke to to mayors you know the mayor of tirana for example a, a city the capital city of albania that was you know a country that was you know uh, in the north korea of europe after mm-hmm. the collapse of communism and a, and a city that was broken for t- after 20 years of, of turmoil and the new young you know mayor uh Arion Veliage, who i don't know if you've come across him from from your um work but he he's he landed on children as a almost a symbol you know a moral um symbol of the future of his city and so uh, today a lot of the good things that are happening in that city are being driven by that lens of children as, as you know being a kind of a way of clarifying and defining the sort of future trajectory of the city of Tirana and I think in a sort of slightly smaller scale way that's what you're seeing with projects like this one in Boulder yeah yeah and you said a few things there that are that are interesting uh, to to try to uh, dive a little deeper into or at least just highlight once again the lens of the city from the child's perspective, and then also their voices. Um, both are, are themes that are, are, are present in the book at, at a higher level. Um, go ahead and, 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 and talk a little bit more about what you literally mean by the voices of the children and the lens of, of, of how the ch- child sees the city. Sure. So um, I think we need to work for and with children so um and those two things that they're, they're two sides of the same coin i think and, and and in my definition of of a kind of child-friendly place mm-hmm. i emphasize both if you like the, the physical uh, appearance if you like or the qualities of the of a space um and the um you know the the children's input into that so there's a process and also an outcome um I, one of the things I wanted to do in the book is, is is learn from some of what I think are the mistakes of some others who've been working in in, in raising the profile of children and young people. And so there's an honourable tradition of well-meaning work around children's participation that goes back two, three, four decades. Some of it actually stems from people like um, Kevin Lynch, um, the, the great urbanist, Right. And, and but it had a very strong focus on on children's voices and, and children's formal participation in in the city decision making. Um, but the reality is that that on its own has had very little, limited impact mm. on how cities have been shaped. And I think that the, the reason is that it, it it became well there are various reasons. One is because we still don't listen to children enough, and I want us to listen to children more. But another reason was that it had too much of a focus. On that sort of process work and not enough on the concrete features of cities that make them work well for kids we don't need to keep asking kids what makes a city work well for them we know this we know we see children around the world whenever we take the time to ask them what do they say they say they like green spaces they like places to play and meet and they like to be able to get around their neighborhoods safely and easily we don't need to keep asking them that. What I think we need to do as adults is build the case for action. So that's the that's the other side of it is is saying you know there is this pretty clear picture of what makes something makes a city or a neighbourhood work for kids. So let's um, uh, you know bring some of the focus into that as well as children's voices and when we do think about the children's voice and involving actual children and young people in an actual neighborhood or a city in say transport or public space let's be clear about why we're doing that 
and about what we want to get out of that process. Because again, one of the lessons from the past has been that the, 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 the children's participation or consultation has sometimes been a kind of idle wheel, you know, or it's been a little bit of window dressing. The kids, the kids get to decide the design of the mural you know, on the wall around the edge of the playground, or they get to choose the logo or the name of a public space. But they don't, their, their views and concerns are not taken seriously at any other level. And I think in my book, I wanted to try and make a case for a more effective and thoughtful um, way of thinking about children's involvement. So, you know, what, what are the questions we want to ask them? How can their voices help define a longer term vision uh, or unpack what that vision means in terms of walking and cycling around a neighbourhood or in terms of the kind of playgrounds we might want to be putting into our parks? Uh, you know, that's the, um, the sort of synthesis that I was, uh, I'm hoping that we'll get uh, you know, as a result of, of the, the case that I make in the book. Yeah. So I, I came back to this image uh, to, to sort of jump into the mobility discussion. Uh, you just mentioned it, that that's one of the key things that kids really want is to be able to get around their neighborhoods and their community. What's really great about this particular um, installation is that, as I mentioned, it's very, very close to the Boulder Creek Path which is a tremendous all ages and abilities facility, a brand new bridge uh, leading from where the creek path is because it's on the other side of the creek. So there's a, a brand new bridge that connects that p pathway, that trail to this facility. And then just up the, the canyon uh, along the, the, the Boulder Creek path is a, you know, a wonderful uh, gosh, it was a, a children's fishing pond that has been there for mm. <laughs> forever. And so kids can, you know, participate in that. So that mobility aspect of being able to get to meaningful destinations like this fabulous experiential place is there. But this next image also talks a little bit about how we can start to reimagine what our streets are for. It goes back to that original history of the fact that the streets, you know, prior to the automobile were, was the public realm, was the place where kids congregated and did stuff and played kickball and did, you know, other types of activities of, of, of play. Walk us through what we're seeing here, because, mm. you know, from a transportation and mobility perspective, we might get a lot of resistance here in North America, as mm. well as in, in other locations around the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what you're seeing here is is um, a, a, a really striking example of a sh w what cities would look like if you place less emphasis on the needs of cars and more emphasis on the needs of children. Um, so this is one of the Barcelona superblocks, mm -hmm. um, and I dare say some of your uh, viewers will be familiar with that idea of of looking, if you like, looking down on the the street grid and and recognizing that actually a lot of that grid. Uh, you can you can you, you can break it up. You can repurpose some of that space that's taken up by tarmac. Uh, you can still allow, you know, reasonable access by motor vehicles, but you can repurpose huge swathes of what used to be streets for recreation, play, socialising, public life. Um, and and I think what's so so the the. The superblock is a is a very dramatic example of that repurposing. It's also fantastic because it's scalable. And again, mm -hmm. you, you may be waiting you know, because you've here you've got a street grid, not unlike the street grids that you see in many North American cities, of course. And so there's a huge amount of redundancy of mm -hmm. you know of of just routes that don't need to be through routes um, and and chunks of that street network that can be turned over to different uses and you can quantify that and you can show you know this scheme probably gave three or four football pitches over to across the the grid to um social life in the city so and and also in barcelona barcelona is a great example of a city that connects the local and these these fine-grained projects with 
the big strategic picture for the city. So Barcelona has a big problem with air pollution. Right. It has a big yeah. problem with climate adaptation it, it, and, and the sort of heat island effect. It, 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 the centre of the city can, can be, you know, unhealthily hot in the summer. And so the city knows it's going to have to do something about that if its citizens are going to be able to, to, to sort of be healthy through the, the, the prospect of, of warmer summers that it's facing. And, uh, and, and noise pollution as well. Barcelona is one of the noisiest cities in Europe. So all of these strategic um, problems that face everyone who lives in Barcelona um, can be tackled by this shift away from domination of streets in, by the car and towards a more sociable, playful, um, and welcoming uh, streets. And then where the children come in is that firstly, children are, let's remember, somewhere between 15 and 25% of any given city's population. Uh, and often, of course, their voices are not heard at all in any formal sense through, through the democratic process. But also, you know, people care about kids. Parents care about kids. Uh, grandparents care about their kids. Uh, people working in public health are worried about, you know, the, the, um, the health of our populations care about kids. And so uh, Barcelona is saying, look, we want to do better by our children. And this sort of this kind of intervention is a, a really powerful way of doing that and building a, a, a wider vision uh, of how we can all make the city better for all of us. Um, yes, car drivers are going to be more inconvenienced, and there's no there's no ducking that. You know, this part of Barcelona is now a little bit harder to drive around than it used to be. Some of the people who have cars who live in this neighbourhood will find their journeys are longer. But um, you you sweeten the pill, and that was a, a quote from a Norwegian civil servant I spoke to. That you sweeten the pill for these bigger strategic changes by talking about the benefits for children and the, the way in which uh, they address children's needs and wishes. And, and again, uh, you know, Barcelona is one city that's doing that, but I could have just said almost exactly the same thing here about Paris and the amazing things that are happening in the city of Paris right now that, are, that are, uh, uh, um, have a very similar flavour. So get to sort of a bit, a bit of a take-home message from my book is most of, if you boil down my book in terms of the, the practical changes we want to see in cities, it's 80% progressive, environmentally minded urban planning and design, 70, 80%. And then there's a layer on top of that of, okay, so what is this, what's the detail about children? Mm -hmm. But but the point about the 80% is that, is that I want to build up the consensus and the support, the public support um, and the institutional support and the municipal support for those progressive urban planning and design measures uh, that we really need to be seeing a lot more of. Yeah, yeah. And pulled up this image here. I believe this uh, is is from London. Uh, walk us through what on yeah. earth has happened here. I mean, you took an absolutely beautiful street uh, with you know motor vehicles being able to go through at high speeds, and you destroyed it. What happened? <laughs> yes, I can. I can hear a, a, a streets film or a streets blog narrative going on. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is. It's, it, it's. It's the. It's the single image in the book that kind of has the best before and after story. I think so. Right. This is Oldgate Square, um, and it's a pretty prominent uh, square in the the uh, city of London. So the financial centre of of the city that I live in, that I call home. It's actually a really interesting square because um, it has, unusually, it has an elementary school. It has a primary school. In fact, the photos that we're looking at, both of them were taken from the roof of the primary school. Uh -huh. So yeah. there are people living in right in the centre of London, in the financial district, as, of course, there are growing numbers of people living in yeah. in uh, the CBDs and downtown areas of cities around the world. But but what this captures, of course, is a, a, a profound and, I think, life-enhancing, inspiring change in the physical properties of this space. That, it, that, 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 that it, you know, its job used to be simply to be a gyratory system for, for traffic. And they 
completely take, taken out all of that traffic function and created one of the most attractive squares in London now. Um, and it, and um, you know, it's, it's a delight to be in. I probably can't quite see, but that bottom image, the left hand side of the square is a set of water fountains. Um, you know, we know how much children and families mm -hmm. uh, enjoy. Even, it doesn't even need to be particularly warm. You know, it can be, uh, or as, uh, you know, I, I, I've got clips and images of, of kids playing in water fountains in grey February mornings. Um, and the, of course, when, when the school day finishes and the kids come out of school and parents meet them, this square absolutely comes alive. And there is something... Um, kind of a bit transgressive even even revolutionary about this change you know mm -hmm. that that a, a bit of the city that would would in you know five years ago nobody would even given a second thought to, to the idea that children might have some kind of stake or or role or visible presence in this bit of my city uh, that now every school day at 3 30 that square is filled with kids, you know, scooting, um, playing in the fountains, uh, chatting with their friends. And at the same time, the office workers are still coming through, um, doing their important adult things. And, and I, 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 I can't lay any personal claim to, to this project. I just, I know some of the people who are involved, mm -hmm. but I do feel a, a really strong kind of emotional investment in the story that these two images tell about how I think we need our cities to change. The other thing that really come, becomes apparent by looking at this image is that we, we see the double-decker uh, bus, transit uh, bus there, and they're in both images. So the area is still being served by transit, and so there is still that, yeah. that function that, that's happening there. Yeah. That's right, but it, but but the power dynamic has shifted, and that's that's the message, yeah. isn't it? It's it's that central to this space is people, right? And crucially, children. There still is some transport around and about, including the public transport, right. but it's moved, you know, to 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 the periphery, which yeah. is so often is the kind of shift, the the shift in power and the shift in function that we need to be seeing in cities around the world. Here, here. Let's, uh, let's give our voices a, a little bit of a break here and watch this fabulous uh, video that you sent our way. I like to be outside and like feel the breeze, the sun. Seeing all the birds and squirrels, butterflies, moths, so many interesting things. I cycle to school because it's fun and the wind blows into my face. Scooting for me is my favourite way to go to school. I usually take my bike or my scooter. I ride to school on my bicycle. Well, usually I go on my skateboard. I walk. We walk. I like my bike because when you ride it, get to do lots of exercise and it's really fun. I feel cycling is very enjoyable. I enjoy it a lot. Puts you in a mood that's like, you, you have to get on with everything, no matter if it's good or bad. I feel powerful because it pumps up my heart rate. It's a really nice way of starting the morning for me. I get to go to far places. To my cousin's house. Going and seeing the swans. To parks and also to shop sometimes. It's a great way to interact with other people. It's less pollution for the world and it doesn't damage the ecosystem. I feel like I'm a big girl. We get to be independent so like we can get ready um, for later on in life. Get to enjoy my life <laughs> and grow into a strong woman. Go anywhere I want by myself. I don't feel safe when there are too many cars. We weren't constantly breathing like fumes from cars. The pavements are quite skinny, so it's hard because then we have to go in a straight line and it's a, like causes collision. 
we should have more bike lanes because it's safer for us children and for us to be safe and have fun and for our parents not to be worried about it. fabulous video. How has this been really received, you know, out there in, in the public? Um, I'll, I'll let you answer that. And then I'm gonna, I have a follow up question um, mm, sure. or, or comment about that. Right. So it's just a bit of background. So that was put together by the London Child Obesity Task Force, um, which is um, working under the mayor of London. I had a little bit of a input into you know the kind of shaping the um, the thinking, but but really it's it's Rachel Toms who's now with Sustrans, you'll know, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. and and a team who put it together. And um, I think I was really keen to see it precisely because it, it it in a really short space of time covers so much of why it matters that we make it easier for kids to get around, right. and you know about about their own wishes, their health, their well-being, their relationship with, with, with others, people, with their friends, um, and, you know, with the planet. And, I mean, I think it's, it's early days. So it was put together and released during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, which are hats off to the team for doing that in the first place because it wasn't easy. Um, I think I'd like it to see, I'd like to see it get more traction and get used more widely. Mm -hmm. um, and right now in the UK, and I know this is true in, in North America as well, there's a very lively, uh, controversial, you know, issues around uh, reducing the, the the presence of traffic, around slowing cars down, mm -hmm. you know, opening up streets for cycling, improving bikeways, and it can get very, very heated. And I strongly believe that 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 we need to see more thinking about children in these debates. And we're, we're still not seeing that a whole lot. We're sort of seeing, to be blunt, different camps of adults throwing rocks at each other. And it's not very edifying, right. um, especially, especially on social media. Right. Um, so I hope that, that this will be a kind of slow burn, this video, that, that, that campaigning groups locally will realize, oh, actually, you know, if we want to make the case for things like what we call low traffic neighborhoods, you know, these sort of neighborhoods that where, where cars or maybe need to, to can't just go all the routes that they used to be able to go, but bikes will be able to, to go through more easily, that those sorts of measures um, have a huge beneficial impact for children, um, for, for children going to school, uh, but also just children, you know, making the trips that we all want them to be able to make. And that uh that's a, a, again a, a kind of case study of how some of these challenging knotty issues uh about you know how do we manage the impact of the car and get a better balance between the needs of car drivers and everybody else in a neighborhood that those knotty issues are, are made a bit less intractable a bit more soluble by thinking about kids but but we're not we're not there yet um and you know, it, it's still the case that while some of these measures and schemes are instantly popular and successful, in other parts of the UK, they've proved very controversial. And sadly, we've even seen some schemes, you know, been taken out after they've been put in, sometimes after just a few weeks, which in my view is is actually, you know, it, it shows, you know, real lack of leadership and, and, and right. um, a, a kind of municipal failure, actually, whereas, you know, what we surely what we need to see is municipal leadership in all of this. Yeah. I, I brought the, the, the Barcelona super block image back up because it illustrates <laughs> something that you were just mentioning in terms of, you know, the traffic calming, the benefits of traffic calming. The way that this scheme works is, you know, these are three by three blocks typically. So it's a nine block uh, square grid system. Around the perimeter of the grid, uh, the traffic moves along at a slightly higher speed, significantly higher speed, really. I believe the, the, the perimeter 
is 30 kilometers per hour. Is that correct? I think that's right. Yes. Yeah. And then interior, the, the, the speed is so, so motor vehicles, you can see a motor vehicle in the, in the distance in this image, uh, is calmed down to a, a 15 kilometer uh, per hour level. You're, you're talking about seven miles per hour, give or take, you know, a fraction or two. <laughs> and uh, what we're really seeing here, though, is these are traffic calmed environments. And then there's permeability for people walking and biking through the within the grid there. Um, and we've been talking a lot about uh, through the eyes of the children and uh, creating this urban kind of playground. But really, when we look at this, from an active town's perspective, I see this as a, a street that's been transformed into a street for people, and it's an all ages and abilities type of uh, uh, an environment and approach. And so I, I think I want to sort of leave us with this concept of the fact that if it's good for children, it's good for everybody. It's not. Right. It, it, it's not to say that hey, oh, well, this this is just child's play. This is just for kids. No, this is truly what we mean in the spirit of mobility, options and choices, and places for people that are appropriate. They're safe and inviting for all ages and abilities. And I think it it really also gets uh you know encapsulated in sort of the closing thoughts from your book. It, it's, it's looking at planning and design through the children's eyes reveals the best way to set cities on a firm course away from ecological, economic, and social decay. Right. And, and it comes back to a really simple point. You know, no parent would ever say, oh, this is a great neighborhood, but I'd never let my kid walk to school. No child would say, oh, I think this is a really nice place to live, but I can't go out and play with my friends. You know, that's the insight. The child is an indicator species. Right. Um, and you're absolutely right. It, it, it speaks to, 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 to age, to, to disability, to gender, um, to inclusion, uh, economic fairness. Uh, all of this is really the same message of, of, of the way we need cities to change. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Before we close, is there anything that we've missed? Anything that we, you want to make sure you leave the audience with here? Um, well, I, I maybe just we, perhaps we should come back to that two by two grid that we mm -hmm. that, that you showed a little bit earlier, and then I wanted to move on to a different image. But but I, I do want to talk mm -hmm. through that because particularly any of your viewers who are actually involved in the nitty gritty of, of changing cities and towns. Right. I'd, I'd really like them to get to grips with this. So, so this is my framework for a child-friendly place. What makes a place, a city or a neighbor child-friendly? And, and I say, and, and this diagram shows that it's, it splits down into two, two dimensions. And, and you'll, Thinking back on a conversation, I'm sure you can see how these both work. There's the there's the things to do dimension. Mm -hmm. You know, a place that's great for kids has lots of choice of of places to go, of 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 nature, of play space, of social and leisure and sport. Um, but that's only one dimension. Um, and we also need the mobility dimension. That it's no good having a neighborhood where there's lots of choice if kids can't get there under their own steam if they're entirely dependent on on you know the adult taxi service so that's where the mobility dimension comes in walking and cycling in particular because of course kids cannot drive so it's only where you've got high levels of mobility mm -hmm. and a lot of choice and variety that you're in that child-friendly quadrant and so if you're involved in any way in shaping your neighborhood, you know, your streets or your city, then those are the twin aspects you want to aim for, going more choice, variety, and uh, higher levels of, of active mobility, making it easy to walk and cycle. Um, and almost everything else that I say in my book drops out of this, this two-dimensional framework. So yes, thank you for the opportunity to, to spell that out. Well, and thank you for the opportunity to to also uh, interject that as somebody who who studied um, gerontology <laughs> in both undergraduate and graduate, I could easily just uh, you know 
put elderly's mobility and and be able to say yeah because this is the concept that we are increasingly seeing with uh our elderly who are sort of stuck in suburban context and once their ability to get around by automobile it starts to 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 be lessened uh, they they feel like this and and so when we think about creating neighborhoods and communities and cities that are are truly vibrant places for all ages and abilities again it comes back to that mantra that is part of the book is that hey if it works well for children it's going to work well for everybody Right. Yeah. And again, I can hear Gil Penalosa, who I know is featured on your yes. programs and who I've been lucky enough to meet a few times yeah. talking about, you know, we have to stop designing cities as if everybody was 30 years old, male and athletic. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tim, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been a real pleasure, John. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all so much for watching this episode featuring Tim Gill. I highly recommend his beautiful and, dare I say, game-changing book, Urban Playground. If you found this episode helpful and interesting, please give it a thumbs up, share it, and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and one last thing. Don't hesitate to let me know if there's a relevant topic, city, or program you'd like me to profile or a potential future guest you'd like me to have on the pod. Well, that's all for now. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.